Ah, uh, finally. Seeing your best friend, who you've been in love with for as long as you can remember, crush on someone else hurts. At first, it was just him stealing glances at this gorgeous blonde bombshell during lunchtime. Slowly, it turned to a downright staring. I would chew on my salad quietly, pretending not to notice and seemingly unbothered. I would fake a smile and join in the usual chatter of our boisterous friend group. Then came the day when he mustered up the courage to finally ask her out, and I had to plaster an unnatural smile on my face and pretend that I was not hurting inside. Seeing your best friend be ecstatic with someone else would not hurt, but it did so feverently for me, seeing as I was in love with him too. I was essentially watching the person that I love fall in love with someone else, someone that was not me. His new and first girlfriend, may I add, started sitting with our friend group, the Aces, we called ourselves. We've been close friends since our elementary school days. I would look down on my sandwich, focusing on the most uninteresting details and doing my best to avert my gaze towards the lovey-dovey couple. Part of me was elated for him. He deserved the world and more. And after a rough patch of childhood, Edward deserved nothing but happiness. But you wished he was happy with you instead, said the sinister voice in my head. But none of the pain that I felt whilst watching him in the arms of a girl could compare to right now. Because let me tell you, seeing your best friend heartbroken hurts. It hurts like a bitch. I wanted to take his pain and go through it for him instead. It started like this. I was baking a fresh batch of cookies, one peaceful evening. I was planning to bring these immaculate chocolate chip cookies to school the next day, as they were my specialty. The Aces loved them, and most importantly, it was Edward's favorite dessert in the world. Since he had gotten together with Trisha, a fellow senior and a gorgeous volleyball player, I have been trying to keep my distance as I respected both of them. I knew my boundaries, but he was still my friend. I tried to show my concern and express my love in more subtle ways. Turns out, I did not have to wait until the next day to express my adoration for this magnetic force of a man. Did they say opposites attract? Because we sure are walking juxtapositions. But somehow, his road seemed to lead him back to me. Or so I would like to think. All he had to do was knock once and I knew my gut, it was him. There was an air of urgency and desperation. The Alvarez household was almost always peaceful, unless Ed would come barging in. This time, though, it felt different. It was not for fun and games. As soon as the door was ajar and I caught my first glimpse of him, I knew something was off. First off, his eyes were weak. His hair was disheveled. He was breathing heavily, evidently calming himself down. Parents home? He asked breathly. I shook my head. What's with you, silly? I asked, stepping aside and letting him in. While observing his rather untidy appearance, it was very unlike him. Of the four of us in the clique, he was always the prim and proper one. He was the trophy. If Aces had a golden child, it would be Edward Duncan, without a doubt. He plopped himself down on the grey living room couch, leaned forward and buried his face in his hands. He sighed deeply. I merely stood adjacent to the couch, not daring to go near him yet. I knew his temperament. He would want distances at times like this. I waited for him to say a word, still gauging his mood. He looked up and his gorgeous green eyes were suddenly teary. The sight of him looking so vulnerable and despondent was heart-wrenching. I wanted to give him a tight hug so bad. He cheated on me, he whispered, looking at the ceiling and unmoving. I stopped dead in my tracks. Pardon? I said instinctively. Trisha, she's been seeing her ex, the rugby player from the Bensons that I was ranting to you about just two weeks ago. That's the one. I caught him red-handed. Eh? That bitch! Since Ed and Trisha started dating months ago, I had been wary of the girl, although she was your typical achiever, volleyball captain, council president, to be valedictorian, all that. Something about her rubbed me the wrong way. I thought to myself, perhaps it was my feelings for Ed, speaking. In short, I was being a bitter little bitch. But there, Ed himself said it. She cheated on him. She cheated on my best friend. She cheated on the man that I have been loving since the day I met him. She cheated on the sole guy in my life that I have ever been sure of. This one felt personal. I cracked my knuckles, suddenly seeing red and ready to hunt that witch down. I'm going to fuck her up. How dare she after you treated her so well, I raged. Not worth it, eh? Calm down. Sit, he replied. See, Edward was better than me in every aspect of the word. He was calm and composed, most of the time at least, while I was irrational and impulsive. He was organized and responsible while I was the klutz and carefree one. He was well-spoken and elaborate while I was the loud and happy-go-lucky type, but I love him anyway. He truly was more level-headed because if it was up to me, I would simply fight Trisha. 
I did not care. She unleashed my inner beast the moment she hurt my best friend and the man you love, said that voice in my head again. I sat next to him wearily, keeping my distance at first but eventually scooting closer. He leaned his head on my shoulder, eyes closed and sniffing every now and then. None of us said a word. We did not have to. I knew he needed peace and at that moment, I gave it to him. Deep down, I was seething. How dare Trisha? I saw what kind of boyfriend Edward was to her. She had a chokehold on him. The man was head over heels in love with her, preparing surprises for their monsteries, which I even helped in occasionally, to my displeasure. He would send her coffee when she needed an extra push to study for that quiz. He would even organize her notes for her and run her errands when her extracurriculars got a bit too hectic. He went great lengths for her and she did this? She hurt the man who gave her his all. She hurt the man that my heart beats for and I resented her for that. The rugby player from Benson's named Jeremiah. Can you believe it? Of all people she would cheat with. It is that one guy. I always felt threatened by that one guy I was insecure over, Edward ranted, evidently frustrated. I rubbed the small of his back and patted his hair. He's nothing on you, E. That man is not even half the man you are. You're amazing, I encouraged. He sniffed and flashed me a weak smile. He pulled away from me and I shook his head. I mean, I'm not that amazing if Trisha cheated on me, am I? He retorted. I rolled my eyes and slapped his arm. Hey, I'm trying to be a good friend here and comfort you. And you're out here talking about that bitch? I replied, a bit too aggressively. Here I was, attempting to give him words of affirmation and comfort him through the tough time. And there he was, talking about Trisha again. Come on now. I hoped deep down that I was not being too obvious about my feelings, though he would not know anyways. For now, I just truly wanted to be there for him, if he needed me. I would gladly set aside my resentment for his cheating ex-girlfriend and focus on being there for him as a friend. Okay, fine, I'm sorry, eh? He said while putting his large hand over mine. I looked down at her overlapping hands and smiled. Don't say sorry, and besides, am I not supposed to be the one comforting you? What do you want, eh? Let loose at a bar? Watch a movie? You choose. You get free reign now, King. I joked, and he laughed softly. I smell freshly baked cookies, eh? I'm offended you have yet to offer your despondent friend an immaculate pastry, he bantered, faking hurt. My mouth dropped and I went to the kitchen in a jiffy. How could I have forgotten? I plated five of the massive chocolate chip cookies and poured a tall glass of milk. I intended to give this to you tomorrow, okay? I defended, but it seems like you need it more now. He moaned audibly after taking a massive bite of the cookie. As creepy as it was, the sound did things to me. Fuck, get your shit together, Anthony. Your best friend is miserable and you're thinking about his moan? You are down bad. This is so perfect, eh? You're the best, he sighed, contently as he put his hand over mine again. I love that feeling. I knew he did not intend it to mean more than just mere gratitude, but I could not help but feel giddy inside. If you let me, I would hold your hand through an eternity, Edward. And hold his hand I did that night. We binged watched his favorite show, The Good Doctor, while wolfing down cookies after another. Eventually, he fell asleep on the couch, resting his head on my shoulder. I held his hand throughout that night, the only act of comforting I could do without being fairly obvious. He left in the wee hours of the morning, and I watched his silhouette disappear into the darkness, hoping I could hold his hand for a little longer. I did not hear from Edward that weekend. I suppose he wanted to take time for himself, so I respected him and gave him the space he needed. Come Monday, and he came to school looking perfectly normal. But I noticed a few details that were off about him, which you would only observe him as much as I did. His t-shirt had a small wrinkle on the side. He always ironed his clothes with the utmost precision, so that was the first sign that his focus was off. His five o'clock shadow was ever so slightly visible. He always shaved on Sundays, so seeing he was unshaven on a Monday was yet another clue that he was not himself. How are you? I asked wearily as we settled in the cafeteria. I prayed to God that we did not bump into Trisha because firstly, I knew it would be like salting Ed's wound. Secondly, I did not know if I could hold back. I might just throw hands when I see her. I would go to any lengths for that man. You want me to lie or Ed queried? I raised my eyebrows. He knew I wanted the truth, of course. He was likely just feeling snappy that morning. I munched on my salad while peering over at him and he sighed. Not so good, eh? I really wonder where I went wrong. I wonder what I lack, he replied. I shook my head vigorously. I saw this coming. There would be a lot of self-blaming and suddenly insecurities surfacing. But I knew Ed's worth more than that. He just needed reminding because Trisha's cheating ass sure made him question himself. Her actions don't define you, E. 
makes me feel useless, eh? But you're not. I mean, you're here. I've been your best friend for what, seven years? I know you, E. You're worth more than this. You deserve so much better. Like me. Cass and Sherwin, the other half of our friend group, just arrived at the cafeteria at this point, and settled beside me and Edward, respectively. Here, here, Sess butted in. You deserve better than that girl, Ed. You're better off without her. Truly, and with that, we're partying on Friday. We need to loosen up, and Ed deserves to have a fun time, announced Sherwin. No excuses, both of you, he eyed at Ed pointedly, as he had the tendency to ditch our night outs to study. He was responsible like that. The rest of us could not really say the same. Fine, he relented. So it's settled, Aces. We'll dance our asses away on Friday. On Monday, I left him yet another fresh box of my home-baked cookies. This time, I mixed up my signature chocolate chip cookie with some oatmeal raisin ones. I attached a short note saying, I oh, will be alright in time. On Tuesday, I brought him a large iced Americano for his afternoon study session in the library. I accompanied him through the night as he toiled in his studies. I was not one for being book smart myself, but the hours seemed to pass by faster when we were together. Suddenly, I too felt motivated to do some work as long as he was by my side. On Wednesday, I invited him over for dinner. Edward did not have the strong support system of a family that I did, so every so often my mother would ask him to dinner, and hope that he feels at ease in the Alvarez abode. That night, I made Edward's favorite mac and cheese, and my mother cooked some chicken to go along with it. He cracked his first smile of the week that night. On Thursday, he was not in school, citing that he was unwell. He rarely took sick leaves, so as soon as my last class of the day was done, I brought him a bowl of chicken noodle soup from the place downtown called Sonia's, and rushed over to his place. I knew he was not physically sick because if he were, we would still come to school. Nonetheless, I prayed that the soup would somewhat heal his soul. And on Friday, we had sex. That Friday night started just like any other. Drinks were on Cess tonight, as this night out was also her advanced birthday celebration. We were at the new club in town called Cess La Vie, and it was jam-packed. But Cess being Cess, she got us a good table overlooking the dance floor. Sooner or later, our table was overflowing with bottles after bottles of liquor. Jagermaster, Bacardi, you name it. We were in for an exhilarating night, and I could not wait to let loose. To Ed, finally moving on from someone who sure as hell does not deserve him, I offered a toast. To Ed, shouted Sherwin and Cess, over the obnoxious blurring music. Ed also took a shot, and immediately seemed to be more relaxed than he has been last week. This was the goal of tonight, for him to forget his troubles even just momentarily, and relish the moment with his friends. Little did we know, Faye has something much more messy up its sleeve. We were only halfway through our second bottle, we opened the Bacardi, and already we were fading fast. One of the aces, Sherwin, was the strongest drinker and followed by Cess. They were party animals, so naturally they had high alcohol tolerance. Ed and I were decent, but at the speed that we were downing our shots, even the strongest among us was already getting lightheaded and carried away. Sooner or later, Cess dragged us all to the dance floor. I was already getting dizzy, but I was ready to party it up nevertheless. Edward seemed to be having the time of his life, no longer cursing at Trisha as he was an hour ago, and instead he was grooving the Calvin Harris's heat stroke, and he was dancing as if his life depended on it. I stood by him and watched him even though I myself was already getting groggy. Breaks in between dances meant more alcohol, and all four of us found ourselves in the midst of a very sweaty but hyped bodies, dancing to the music of Nicki Minaj, and the like. One way or another, I found myself grinding against a guy, and to my utmost horror, it was Edwards. Our eyes locked for a moment, and yet he was seemingly enjoying it, and so did I. Another round of drinks, and I was gone. The actions that followed afterwards were hazy. We hailed a cab to go to Edward's place. We were so desperately kissing in the back seat. We both reeking of urgency as he dragged me out of the cab and into his room. The last thing I remember before the bliss was him taking off his pants and me thinking, so this is what heaven feels like. Are you avoiding me? Questioned Edward as soon as he finally managed to corner me during lunchtime on Monday. I had successfully avoided him all weekend long. And that Monday morning, I had to go to the dentist and miss the first through second periods, so I did not have to see him. However, I knew that I had to face him sooner or later, so I mustered up the courage to go to lunch. Conveniently, Sess and Sherwin were nowhere to be found, but I suppose they strategically planned this to avoid being in the middle of me and Edward. No, I replied, unconvincingly, picking on my salad. Edward settled in the chair beside me and scooted his chair over. Yes, you are. I rolled my eyes and continued moving the greens in my salad aimlessly. Then, why bother asking? 
You regret it, don't you? No, said the voice in my head. Sure, we had a drunken night out, but Edward was still Edward, and I had sex with the man that I had been desiring for years. Although the conditions were not as favorable as I would have dreamed, I still had him. I kissed him. He was inside me. And part of me wished, however, that it was not just alcohol that induced us to do that. A part of me wished that we could make love without the influence of alcohol this time around. I don't regret it, he whispered, when I did not utter a word. My eyes must have looked like they were bulging out because I was floored, to say the least. What was his intention? What was his motive? I could not tell. Is this fun and games to you? Oh look, my ex-girlfriend cheated on me, but it's all good. I betted Anthony, who has been so obsessed with me in the past few years. I think he might even be in love with me. How could he not be? I'm the ever so amazing Edward, I mocked. A flash of hurt was evident in Ed's face as soon as I said that, and I felt a pang of guilt. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I apologized instantly, as soon as the weight of the harsh word sunk in. No, it's fine. For the record, I didn't feel that way. The night with you, sure, we were both not ourselves, but I enjoyed it. And admittedly, I do not regret it. Whether you feel the same way or not is out of the question, but for me, well, it was odd at first, and very surprising, I grew into it. I accepted it. I enjoyed it. Why, you may ask? Because that was the first time in my life that I had made love to a person, and it felt right. I don't know how. I don't know why. I can't quite explain it. But two ex-girlfriends I've had, and none of them felt like that. He went on and on. But if that's what you think of me after Friday night, then I'm afraid what I felt after we had sex was one-sided. We managed to go through the rest of the week without mentioning that incident on Friday night or his sudden outburst during lunch on Monday. We would talk casually and joke around in the presence of Sess and Sherwin, and yet there was tension hanging above us. It was like unresolved issue waiting to explode any minute. On the other hand, Edward did not mention Trisha anymore, and when we were walking to class, we would bump into her and there was no hostility on his part. He was nonchalant, as though he had moved on, and I was happy for him. He deserved to live in peace and be happy. We were just stumbling upon the closest normal we could after the train wreck of the last two weeks, when Edward confronted me. It was only me and him at my house this afternoon. My mom prepared us lemonade and cut us a slice of cake, each, as we did our homework in the backyard. Edward was ruffling his hair as he swung on our hammock while taking a study break. He was in distress, but I was unsure of what. I peered over at him and raised my eyebrow, wondering what got him so deep in thought. Penny for your thoughts? I asked inquisitively. He shook his head slightly. Just thinking, eh? I'm thinking about how kind you have been to me through this rough patch of my life. Actually, scratch that. Not just this rough time, but pretty much every single difficult time that I'd gone through. You were there for me. You're the common denominator of me getting through my obstacles in life. I was perplexed. What was he going with this? I urged him on with my eyes, waiting for him to drop the bomb. He simply stared at me his green eyes penetrating my brown ones, and it was as if I was being exposed to him. He has never stared at me with that much intensity. I felt conscious all of a sudden. It was as though he could see right through me. What if he finally knew how I felt for him? Would he cut ties with me? If he had known that despite my semi-unconscious drunken state, I had enjoyed our night together, would he still want to befriend me? Where are you going with this? I finally asked. He swallowed a lump on his throat and diverted his gaze from me. Suddenly, bushes of my mother's flowers were interesting for him, and he stared at them instead. My god, he muttered. My god, this can't be. I got up from my seat opposite him and stood beside the hammock where he was sitting. What is it? What is it? You love me, he said plainly, as if he had known all along, deep down, but only just now realizing. You stood by me because you cared for me, and I had my first girlfriend. I remember feeling confused as to why you felt so aloof. You avoided me, remember? I nodded, recalling the time that I could not look him in the eye for a week after we had told our friend group that he was dating Naomi Millers. I could not stomach seeing him with someone else, so I did what I was best at, avoidance. But I could not escape because he was relentless in finding out what was wrong with me. He initially thought I knew of Naomi's fatal flaw and did not want to be the one to break the news to him. But of course, that was not true. He also thought that I was feeling left out because at that point I was the only person in the group without a significant other. Now he knew that my sadness did not stem from that. It was melancholia, stemming from him finding someone else that was not me. It's not that you didn't like Naomi or you felt out, he said retrospectively. You were jealous. 
Uh-huh, I affirmed. And every single girl after that, I was jealous of too. Momentarily. At least then I would snap out of my riviere and ponder over the fact that we have no chance. I have no chance. So I did what I could do best, to express my love for you. I became a faithful friend. A fiercely loyal and dependable friend of yours, waiting for my turn, if it ever comes. I see it now. We walked to lunch together, hand in hand, the next day. To this date, I still not know how it happened, except it just did. As cliche as it sounded, it was you belong with me type of situation where Edward finally realizes that the one he has been looking for, the one that the ex-girlfriends could not compare to, was me. Surely, they were all beauty and brains, and I, well, I was decent. But my consistency and the stability I provided in Edward's life was unmatched. I completed him, just as he completed me. Ed was a massive hopeless romantic, so all throughout high school, the girls he had pinned over were subject to his very own high standards. He accumulated these attributes from books, movies, and poems, most of which I either watched with him or read because of him. I was that down bad. As we walked into the cafeteria that day, our hands intertwined. It felt as though all the eyes were on us. I hated being under scrutiny. If there was one pet peeve that I had, it was drawing unnecessary attention to myself. And this was one instance where that was very much applicable. We reached our usual table where Sess and Sherwin were already digging into their mac and cheese and macaroni salad, respectively. When their gaze focused on their interlocked hands, they were on cloud nine. Finally, Sess was the first to exclaim. Long overdue, my dudes, said Sherwin. Everyone saw it. Everyone but you guys. He and I looked at each other and cracked a smile at one another. Perhaps that was right. It was always us all along. Now we see it, I mumbled. Edward cracked a smile and squeezed my hand. Finally. The end. Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing to become part of our Rainbow Force and stay wholesome.